It was the summer of 1965. The mission of Gemini 5, plagued as it had been with unreliable fuel cells, nevertheless has, at least outwardly, put NASA in a tenuous tie with the Soviet Union in human spaceflight. A year ago, Voskhod 1 and 2 had performed the first multi-crewed spaceflight and first spacewalk, respectively. But Conrad and Cooper's eight-day mission had smashed the five-day record set by Vostok 5 in 1963. And with their own spacewalk having been achieved on Gemini 4, NASA is now within striking range of a clear lead in manned space achievement. But the performance of the fuel cells on Gemini 5 leaves a big question mark hanging over the prospect of future, even longer duration flights. However, before that, one thing must be performed that not even the Soviets have yet accomplished. Someday, space will be a common medium for traffic, both passenger and freight. The techniques of rendezvous must not only be perfected, but the procedures must become as second nature to pilots and traffic controllers before we will maneuver with supreme confidence. But now we are just learning to fly. We are concerned with a short period of time known as a launch window. Whether we are journeying to a distant planet or merely a scant 150 miles to dock with a target vehicle, liftoff can occur for rendezvous only when two requirements are met. First, our launch site must be close to a geometric plane passing through the orbit of the target and the center of the Earth. And second, specifically in Gemini-type rendezvous missions, the target vehicle must have just passed over the launch site. Rendezvous is, at this point in time, an entirely theoretical concept. It would be necessary in order to fulfill the dreams of lunar exploration later in the decade. The act of bringing two objects, launched separately at different times and perhaps even different places on Earth, together in orbit, both traveling well beyond even hypersonic velocities, was a pipe dream just a couple years ago. But NASA in 1965 was a far cry from the NASA of 1961. A new mission control center in Houston, supported by one of the largest and most robust data and communication networks ever conceived, the Manned Spaceflight Network. The American space program was now a nexus of ambition, talent, and federal government spending. Fiscal year 1965 would prove to be the largest budget in NASA's history up to that time, and it would continue to grow, peaking in 1966 at nearly 4.5% of the U.S. federal budget. We were all individuals uh, pulling the wagon in the same direction, but competing to be the lead horse, competing for flights all the time. We were the new kid on the block. We were the neophytes, you know. We were the kids that were supposed to listen and not talk. And you do it everything from patting people on the back and say, don't forget to do a good job. And they did take ownership. Everyone who put a nut and bolt in, in, a, in a Mercury Gemini and Apollo spaceship owned it. I mean, they were responsible for your success and safety. That goes along with my, something my dad always used to tell me as I grew up, just go out and do your best. You're not going to be better than everyone at everything. But sooner or later, you're going to surprise yourself. He was right. I did. NASA's approach to rendezvous, as it had been to the development of the Mercury capsule, emphasized computers and automation. Things that the astronauts and some engineers, such as Dean Grimm, believed could and would fail under certain conditions. Working together with rookie astronaut Buzz Aldrin, who studied orbital rendezvous for his doctoral thesis at MIT, methods were developed that would allow for pilot intervention at various stages of the complex, counterintuitive process of bringing vehicles together in space. The mission of Gemini 6, slated for the fall of 1965, would be to put into practice the orbital maneuvers required to effect a successful rendezvous. Seven different flight profiles are considered. Depending on the time between both launches, the orbital plane, and the target altitude. 
The target vehicle for the Gemini spacecraft is this. A NASA-modified version of the Lockheed Corporation's Agena upper stage. This cigar-shaped vehicle was originally developed to launch spy satellites into orbit atop ICBMs, namely the Thor and Atlas rocket families. To serve as a target for the crewed Gemini spacecraft, NASA has fitted the Agena with an upgraded Bell Systems XLR-81 rocket engine capable of multiple in-orbit restarts. In addition, a secondary propulsion and control system, an onboard command computer that can interface with the Gemini spacecraft, externally mounted visual tracking aids, and most importantly of all, the docking unit located on the opposite end of the primary propulsion system. This non-androgynous docking system is generally known as a male-female design. The female Agena, with its concave docking collar, receives the rendezvous and recovery section, the nose of the so-called male Gemini spacecraft. The very front of the r, &R section is replete with latch receptacles, multiple fat circular antennas, a radar system, and umbilical connections that allow for an electronic link to be established between the two vehicles once a physical one has been achieved. To the casual observer, it's a jumbled mess of systems, all tightly packed together on an area of the spacecraft where real estate is at a premium. To fly a rendezvous, the two astronauts will have to use their Gemini onboard computer like they've never used it before. Using the manual data insertion unit and reading out values from specialized onboard instruments such as the incremental velocity indicator, which measures velocity changes across all three axes of motion. Gemini 6 will slowly but surely close the gap between itself and the Agena target, working in close conjunction with ground radar and, when necessary, even reprogramming their primitive digital computer from an onboard 550-foot-long preloaded reel of magnetic tape. Much of the trajectory planning work is still done by the unsung female heroes of NASA's computing unit. Names such as Kathy Osgood, Melba Roy Mouton, and Shirley Hunt. All making their mark in America's drive to the moon. All of this, of course, depends on a successful launch of an Agena atop the Atlas missile. A derivative of the same kind used to launch Americans into orbit in Project Mercury. The plan is to use the Atlas Agena just one orbital period ahead of the Gemini. Just over an hour and a half later, the astronauts will ride the Titan into space in pursuit. In line to fly the Gemini 6 mission is Mercury veteran and Navy Captain Wally Shara, the ultimate aviator, ever in pursuit of flying the perfect mission. His fellow crew member is spaceflight rookie Tom Stafford, a U.S. Air Force major. 10 a.m., October 25th. Fifteen minutes after climbing aboard their spacecraft, Shara and Stafford are subject to intense noise and vibration as the nearby Atlas, located at a neighboring pad just 1.1 miles away, roars into the sky. We have ignition. And a liftoff right on the button. Right on the arrow. The Atlas booster performs its job as advertised, and the Agena rocket separates. After only a few seconds, telemetry cuts off. No official word is announced for nearly 50 minutes, but radar tracking data soon after the loss of telemetry shows five tumbling pieces where once was an intact rocket stage. The mission of Gemini 6 is over before it has begun. 
Shara and Stafford's launch is temporarily pushed back 10 days, but everyone knows that without a rendezvous target, their mission is pointless. It'll be some time before another Agena target vehicle will be ready, as an investigation needs to take place as to what caused the explosive failure. Many quickly suspect it is the Bell-manufactured primary propulsion system engine, which has been a cause for concern for some time. The failure of the first Agena in Project Gemini represents a critical bottleneck at a crucial time. America is on the brink of snatching for itself a true first. NASA cannot afford failures or slowdowns now. It's almost 1966, and the space race is neck and neck. Meanwhile, the McDonnell team, responsible for the Gemini spacecraft, begin to talk about the feasibility of using one of their own crewed vehicles as a rendezvous target. In essence, launching two manned missions close enough together in time so as to allow them to meet up in orbit. With the Agena temporarily grounded, it seems the only way forward at a time when progress is demanded at a fever pitch. But NASA has designed their entire infrastructure in Gemini with a two-month turnaround in mind. Even this was much more aggressive than was seen during Project Mercury. The two large missiles would have to use the same launch pad. So as soon as the fires were out after launch number one, the rollout would begin for launch number two. Spacecraft 6, like numbers 3 and 4, does not have fuel cells. From its very inception, Gemini 6 was meant to be a short-duration rendezvous and docking demonstration flight. As such, it carries only batteries in its service module. However, Spacecraft 7, next off the line, is like Gemini 5 designed for a long-duration mission. With the bulk of the kinks and growing pains hopefully worked out of the fuel cells as a result of Gemini 5, the optimistic thinking is that Gemini 7 can nearly double its length, aiming for not eight days in space, but two weeks. What if Gemini 7, with its long duration flight plan and onboard fuel cells, became the rendezvous target for a remanifested Gemini 6? As fall turns to winter, that's exactly what NASA gears up for. Gemini 7 will launch first, into the very same orbit targeted for the first Agena vehicle. And at some point during its 330-hour mission, Gemini 6 will fly into space after it. NASA, in late 1965, is growing into a well-oiled machine. Under the leadership of people like George Mueller, Chuck Matthews, Chris Kraft, Robert Gilruth, John Mayer, Bill Tyndall, John Hodge, and many, many others. Excellent communication, leadership, and strong administrative support gave them the flexibility necessary to pivot hard and strong in a new direction and fly a completely refocused dual mission in time for Gemini 7's original launch date. They had come a long way since the days of Project Vanguard. The crew of Gemini 7 consists of two spaceflight newcomers. The commander is Air Force Major Frank Borman. The pilot is Navy Lieutenant Commander Jim Lovell. Gemini 7 is rich with onboard experiments, though most have flown on prior Gemini flights. One experiment of interest is to test the use of an onboard laser to communicate with the ground station on Earth. These early lasers utilize a technique called gallium arsenide injection, chosen for its relative compactness and weight at the time. Other modifications have to be made for the Gemini 7 spacecraft in order to make it a viable target for Gemini 6, including the addition of external lights, antennas, and a transponder. One interesting change made for Gemini 7 are the spacesuits. Neither Borman nor Lovell are slated to conduct a spacewalk during their two-week mission, and NASA's experience aboard Gemini 5 made them nervous about crew comfort over such a long period of time in space. Up to now, astronauts have been wearing their pressure suits for the entire duration of the mission. Cooper and Conrad, upon their return to Earth, were sweaty, smelly, and uncomfortable. Cramped, chafed, and hot, across multiple days in space. 
Once again, spacecraft contractor McDonnell came to the rescue. Writing on the positive results of an internal test program, they began to float ideas of flying into space using only standard flight suits and crash helmets, ideas that would eventually lead, two decades later, to practices observed in the early space shuttle program prior to the Challenger disaster. However, at this point in time, many balk at the idea of leaving the crew entirely vulnerable to fires and depressurization. So a compromise is made. The development of a so-called lightweight suit that could be worn for long duration missions without an EVA component. This suit would not only be much lighter but also more flexible and, at least on paper, easy to quickly put on and take off. Selectively wearing a pressure suit during critical flight phases would eventually become the norm in Apollo. The lightweight suit, like the Gemini and Mercury suits before, was produced by the David F. Clark Company of Worcester, Massachusetts. December 4th, 1965. In the early afternoon, Borman and Lovell rocket into space aboard Spacecraft 7. The flight of Gemini 7, the beginning of the longest space mission ever attempted by man. Just short of 14 days in space. And if their launch is successful, they will should become the target of the Gemini 6 spacecraft. A successful endurance and rendezvous mission by the four astronauts will confirm space planners have adopted a good plan to place two Americans on the moon before the end of the decade. Now back to Gemini Control. Minus 20 seconds. Seven, six, five, four, three, two, one. Ignition. Lift off. Roger off. Roger pitch. Roger mode two. Roger update. Roger, guidance initiate and fuel cell delta feed lights. Roger, Seco. Gemini 7, Houston, you are go. That's the best sim we've had. Roger, booster inside. As they separate from the second stage of the Titan missile, they perform an about face and begin to station keep with the depleted cylinder. This is the act of manually holding a relative position, flying in a kind of stable formation in low Earth orbit. This task is made difficult by the profuse venting of unburnt fuel, which causes the upper stage to begin tumbling. The booster is venting uh, The booster is slowly venting. It's really venting, really. It is really venting, Roger. Understand you're in just the right spot. Gemini 7 Houston, they're already cleaning off the pad. Gemini 7 Houston, how is the station keeping going? Roger, understand going very well. Each Gemini spacecraft contains pages upon pages of changes and improvements to the hardware, wiring, subsystems, and internals that, while retaining the overall form factor and shape, nonetheless clearly make it a modular vehicle, tinkered with and improved upon each foundational flight. Borman and Lovell's vehicle is no exception. Carrying the many changes made to iterate and improve upon the building body of flight experience. Just under four hours into their mission, Gemini 7, now well finished with its station keeping maneuver, performs an orbital trim with its aft thrusters settling into a 120 by 174 nautical mile orbit. 
on the ground, NASA was busy pulling off a miraculous turnaround of LC-19, racing against time to launch the second piece of their dual mission. 77 Houston, remoting through Kano. How do you read? Roger, loud and clear. We're standing by for your burn. Roger, we completed the burn early here. We've already situated and we're performing deep RD7. Roger, Gemini 7. And we still have a fuel cell Delta P light. Roger, still have the fuel cell Delta P light. Is the oxygen pressure coming up at all yet? Negative, it's still going down. It's 100 pounds now. Roger. Borman and Lovell quickly learn that the G-5C spacesuit is not nearly as comfortable as advertised. After a tenuous negotiation with Mission Control, they agree to take turns wearing it, the other astronaut able to take it completely off and seeing a marked improvement in sleep, performance, and comfort. 48 hours into their mission, the pair observe as a Polaris SLBM is launched from the nuclear submarine USS Benjamin Franklin capturing these stunning sequences of a missile rising up from below. They offer a rare and chilling context. A window into the reality of the Cold War still raging on Earth. Later in their mission, the pair would track the re-entry of a Minuteman missile. The pair conduct a prograde maneuver at 70 hours as the countdown of Gemini 6 now officially labeled Gemini 6A, inches ever closer. All systems aboard Spacecraft 7, including the critically important fuel cells, are performing admirably. NASA's plan is coming together, closer and closer, bit by bit. On Flight Day 5, a series of maneuvers performed by Spacecraft 7 places it in the target orbit. They were now at 33% fuel, in their orbital attitude and maneuvering system. As the days tick by, six, seven, eight, and nine, they once again enter drifting flight, desperately trying to conserve fuel as they wait, hoping against hope that Gemini 6 will be able to launch in time. On the morning of December 12, 1965, Gemini 6A enters its terminal count. Shara and Stafford are ready to try again, as they prepare to ride the forked flame and catch up with Lovell and Borman waiting for them in orbit. You are cleared for takeoff. Roger, scramble one. All right, here, adios. Hey, shit. We have a shutdown, Jimmy Six. My clock has started. No, no lift off. Verify program reset. No lift off. At T plus 1.2 seconds, an electrical umbilical releases prematurely. This action causes the clock on board the Gemini spacecraft to begin counting up, which is one of the indications the astronauts have that the liftoff has begun. Except it hadn't. The engines simply sputtered and died, and Wally and Tom are left there, in Wally's own words, just seconds later. That's okay, we're just sitting here breathing. Roger. All right, Frank, I know you guys did your best. Hold Coming around the northeast side of the pad. I just want to know what sprays are on. The two astronauts lie still atop a 150-ton vehicle filled with highly explosive propellant that was just for a few seconds on fire. Upon review, Almost everyone agrees that had an automatic system been in control, the disparity between the mission clock and the lack of momentum would have resulted in a launch abort, triggering the ejection seats and destroying the Gemini spacecraft. However, 
the calm, human hands of the professional test pilots remain still. Watching their gauges and communicating with the ground, they gingerly go through the process of safing the massive missile, and once removed from it, the investigation begins as to what went wrong. The plug dropping out early is indeed what caused the onboard computer to shut the engines down. Because there was no upward movement, within the extremely short, precise time frame required, an electrical signal closed the fuel valves and scrubbed the launch. However, something deeper was going on at the same time, something which horrifies the engineers and technicians on the ground. The thrust from the Titan rocket was unstable before the fuel valves had been closed. Something else was wrong with that engine. Something that may not have manifested for a precious few seconds, long enough to get Gemini 6 in the air, and only then begin to fail. Searching all night, Aerojet personnel find a dust cover on an oxidizer inlet, erroneously left in place prior to launch. The electrical plug dropping out early wasn't an issue, it was a miracle. It stopped the launch of a vehicle that was destined to fail in mid-air. The two astronauts cannot believe their luck. Few people actually believe that the Gemini launch escape system, which relies on ejection seats, can actually throw the astronauts far and fast enough away to clear the expanding fireball of an exploding Titan II. Not to mention the inevitable injuries that would result from such acceleration. As Gemini 7 reaches its ninth day, NASA is out of time. They've got no choice but to recheck re-clear, and retry the launch of Gemini 6A with the same hardware on the pad. They've got just three days to make ready. Uh, we just completed a whole series of final status checks in the countdown in which all elements report in on their status, both in the blockhouse and in the mission control centers, both here at the Cape and the mission control center in Houston. All elements reported go. When the command pilot, who's designated Crewman 1, came in to report, Wally Shiraz said, for the third time, go. We're at T-minus three minutes in holding. This is Gemini Launch Control. December 15th, 1965. Third time's the charm. So everybody hopes. T-minus 40 seconds and counting. All still looking good. All quiet on the communications at the present time. T-minus 10. Nine, eight, seven, six, five, four, three, two, one, zero. Houston, three hours, 52 minutes into the flight. At uh, 11.25 local time, spacecraft six began its circularization burn, a burn of some uh, 44 seconds. That was completed. There was some residuals left on their IVIs. They trimmed this up. And uh, we are advised now our orbit is approximately 148 by 144 on six. This would put it uh, very close to the desired 15 miles below the orbit of seven, which is uh, being carried as 163 by 159. The um, 
two pilots are communicating now much more easily. They've completed a radar lock-on test very successfully. And at three hours and 54 minutes into the flight, we show them about 150 miles, make that 155 miles apart. Roger, copy. Radar test is valid. Standing by for your burn. Roger. Roger, understand. No joy visual contact. Over the course of four orbits, some six hours, the two spacecraft begin to come into view. Radar tracking is achieved between the two vehicles, and eventually, each begin to see a new star, a single point of light out there in the vast distance of space. Borman and Lovell watch their star pulse and puff as Gemini 6 fires its reaction jets in the blackness of the void. Gemini 7 had been in space now for 11 days, the longest of any manned spacecraft up to that point by far. To the cramped astronauts, the rendezvous of Gemini 6 was an exciting change of pace from an otherwise lonely flight. This is Gemini Control Houston, four hours, eight minutes into the flight of Gemini 6, 262 hours, 16 minutes into the flight of 7. Meanwhile, advised uh, regarding Dr. Lovelace, the search for Dr. Lovelace, the chief of NASA medical programs at NASA headquarters in Washington, a helicopter has spotted the wreckage of the Lovelace plane. It has been positively identified as the plane. A ground search party is moving on the wreckage. We have no estimate as to how long it will take them to reach the wreckage which is 11,000 feet up on a mountain peak about 20 miles south of Aspen, Colorado. Flight away. Go ahead. I think you can advise all sites. They can go to a single transmitter antenna setup. Roger. And we're showing radar lock. Roger. This is, uh, this is the waiting time, of course, and it's all up to them. This is Gemini Control, Houston. Now we have raised the six spacecraft over the range tracker. Tom Stafford advises in the calmest voice I think we've ever heard that they are 120 feet apart and sitting. 120 feet apart and sitting. And when uh, Tom Stafford came through with that reading that of 120 feet and, and sitting, here in the control center, everyone broke out an American flag and pinned it up on his console. There must be fully uh, 40 flags in this room right now. Everyone is standing. Every room uh, looking on this mission control operations room is jammed with people. Neither crew is prepared for the jumbled mess that streams out from the adapter mating section in the rear of each spacecraft. It is the first time that astronauts are able to see a Gemini spacecraft in orbit. The moment is one of exhausted, quiet celebration in mission control. 
As Wally Shara performs an in-plane fly-around of Gemini 7, he describes the experience of rendezvous as, quote, easy. Blood, sweat, toil, and tears had led to this moment. The United States was now undeniably ahead. They're presently running about 20 feet apart. They're in conversation over to Nana Reeve. They're using the docking light from six to illuminate the scene. And uh, they're also using seven's cabin lights. You can hear Jim Lovell uh, ask Wally Shira if he can see Frank Mormon's beard. And Wally says he certainly can. He can see uh, Jim Lovell's beard even sharper, though. For three orbits, the two spacecraft perform an orbital ballet, flying in formation. The OAMS control system is so precise that at times neither crew fires any thrusters for periods of up to 20 minutes. It had come just in time. Gemini 7 was now limping along. Condensation, degrading thrusters, and the eventual failure of two fuel cells. The failure of the onboard tape recorder. The walls were closing in. For nearly two weeks now, we've been beaming daily, music up to our pilots, two for most of the time, four for the last uh, 24 hours. This morning the pilots got their revenge. Listen carefully now to the early part of the stateside ba pass when the Gemini 6 crew reversed the process. Gemini 7, Houston, did you call? Roger, I just want to know if you're up on the air today. Roger. The day just after the rendezvous, on December 16th, Shara and Stafford, now separated from Gemini 7, perform an on-time retrofire. Shara uses the ballistic lift properties of the Gemini re-entry vehicle to steer towards the target area. It is the first time a re-entry has flown fully guided from start to finish. Manually depressing their inbound trajectory by rolling the spacecraft, they land just seven nautical miles from the planned splashdown point. 25 hours, 15 minutes, and 58 seconds. The mission of Gemini 6A was over. Spacecraft 7, left in orbit, drags on. It barely has enough electrical power to clear the 14-day threshold. Two weeks is more than enough time for a mission to the moon with days to spare. An American spacecraft had supported a mission long enough to cross the lunar finish line, whenever that day would come. 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1, retrofire. Roger. All Gemini missions carry onboard science experiments, even having specialized hardware to that effect, such as extendable magnetometers, micrometeoroid detectors, and radiation instrumentation. Most of the science was, however, by its nature, fairly low priority, as Project Gemini is, more than anything else, a program of operational development. By the end of 1965, the total U.S. man-hours in space had been brought to 1,354 hours and 19 minutes, more than double the Soviet total. 1965 was over. 
It had seen the opening salvos of the second act on both sides of the space race. From Leonov's spacewalk to the failure of the Atlas Agena, it was not a year without setback for the Americans. But its ending fills many with hope. Optimism and the knowledge that NASA's plan, despite the problems, was working. 1966 would be just as aggressive, if not more so. NASA had only used half their Gemini spacecraft and Titan II launch vehicles. A conference is called, in early 1966, to determine what shape the latter part of Project Gemini would take. Understanding what happened to the Agena is a critical priority. Many come to believe it boils down to the fuel system aboard the primary propulsion engine. Unlike prior Agena models, fuel flows into the combustion chamber before oxidizer. This likely led to a buildup of fuel and a powerful detonation upon ignition. Steps are taken to return to the older system of ensuring that oxidizer flows first. However, no one is 100% sure that this is actually what went wrong, and that the aforementioned solution will solve anything. So, NASA begins to make contingency plans. While future missions will still require an Agena, hardware is set aside for the possible use of what is known as an Augmented Target Docking Adapter, or ATDA, as part of a Plan B known as Project Surefire. By eliminating the Agena rocket stage entirely, they may be able to orbit just the docking module by use of the Atlas booster alone. It wouldn't be nearly as controllable or sophisticated as an Agena, but with the suspect stage now under intense scrutiny, backup planning becomes the norm. Rendezvous is a tremendous accomplishment, but it's useless if the two vehicles can't dock and be brought together in a solid link-up. The upcoming Gemini missions are planned out. NASA still had conducted only one spacewalk, Ed White's few minutes of tethered bliss on Gemini 4. The new missions, Neil Armstrong and David Scott on Gemini 8, Charlie Bassett and Elliot C. on Gemini 9, John Young and Michael Collins on Gemini 10, all include spacewalks. NASA needs to make walking outside not an inherent accomplishment or novelty, but simply part of their repertoire, if they should expect to set foot upon the lunar surface in just four short years. Borman and Lovell's marathon 14 days provides a boon of data for the medical concerns of lunar missions. Such a long time spent in a low pressure environment of just five PSI, equivalent to 27,000 feet of altitude. Micrometeorites, Radiation and the respiratory and circulatory systems of the human body are all avenues of study, though not the main focus of NASA during Project Gemini. And, uh, you know, two weeks with Frank Borman any place is a, is a challenge. <laughs> but, but, but this flight, uh, the, the spacecraft is very tight, so I didn't feel too nauseous at all. It was pretty good. But the suits were very hot, sweaty, and bulky and uh, they didn't want us to take off our suits. These were the old days when they were very worried about leaks in spacecraft or something like that. Well, we knew the spacecraft wasn't leaking. The doctors, of course, were, you know, this was, can man live in space? And the reason for the mission was that the maximum time to go to the moon and back, and we're already planning for Apollo, was two weeks. And so they said, well, if we could put people up into zero gravity for two weeks, they'll prove out one aspect of the, of the moon flights. It must be said that much of what is attempted at this fetal point of spaceflight history is propelled in large part by hope. Hope in the belief that the human body can adapt. That long-term spaceflight and microgravity won't prove to be obstacles to our vitality. And in some respects, the relative ego of test pilot culture acts as a binding agent for this hope. Many astronauts simply don't report things they view as minor or insignificant. Plus, the pharmaceutical culture of the 1960s was much more cavalier when it came to self-medication. Just take another pill. If the astronauts had trouble sleeping, 
they could take Sikanol, a highly addictive barbiturate. It wouldn't be until the 1970s when true health science in space would begin as a field of study in its own right, and not until space stations like the Soviet Mir and the International Space Station was complete would serious attention and resources be used to that effect. Traveling to other planets would take not days nor months, but years, perhaps decades. Other stars? Centuries, if not millennia. Our definition of, quote, long-term spaceflight, just as our definition of deep space, has evolved with our outwardly growing experience. The results of the mid-program conference are published in February 1966. Three days later, astronauts Bassett and C, slated for the Gemini 9 mission, fly their T-38 Talon from Ellington Air Force Base in Texas to the McDonnell plant in St. Louis, Missouri, where their spacecraft was being built. Tom Stafford and rookie astronaut Eugene Cernan, the Gemini 9 backup crew, are flying alongside. The weather was bad, with precipitation and low clouds. As Elliot C. circles his plane around beneath the low cloud deck, Tom Stafford, in the other plane, loses sight of him and gains altitude, climbing back above the deck. With the ground shrouded in dense fog, Stafford isn't able to witness C's plane strike the roof of the spacecraft assembly building, losing its right wing and spiraling out of control into a parking lot. A stream of fire and they're gone. Both astronauts in less than a second. This was the second time that NASA astronauts had died in a T-38, the first being Theodore Freeman, who suffered a bird strike in 1964. The investigation finds nothing at fault with the aircraft. Yet another tragedy to add to the growing list of what is clearly a dangerous business. C's decision to make a visual circling approach in poor weather, acceptable by standards at the time, is what led to the accident. The more conservative Stafford, who elected to fly a missed approach, is now, just off of his first flight with Shara on Gemini 6, bumped into the prime crew position. He and the rookie Cernan take no pleasure in stepping into the shoes of their deceased comrades. The days ahead would be tough. March 16, 1966. NASA's ready to try again on the original flight profile of Gemini 6. An Agena launch, followed 90 minutes later by Neil Armstrong and David Scott aboard their ship, Gemini 8. Armstrong, a former naval aviator, served in Korea. He retired from the Naval Reserve in 1960, having achieved the rank of Lieutenant Junior Grade. Scott, at the time of the flight, is an Air Force Major. Their flight plan, as has become the norm, is more than ambitious. They aim to make the first successful docking in orbit, but beyond that, rendezvous and dock multiple times, and conduct a spacewalk eight times longer than Ed White's adventure, at some two hours and forty minutes outside. Scott will retrieve a backpack located in the concave space of the Gemini adapter section. That, and a chest pack located on its front, will extend his oxygen supply and provide fuel for a handheld zip gun, much like the one used by Ed White, albeit with a different fuel and more capacity. Their planned 71-hour mission is chock full of activity, the vast majority of which is pioneering in nature. It was a bold move. One visible change being implemented for the mission of Gemini 8 and onwards is a slight alteration to the surface of the Gemini spacecraft adapter section. Up to now, one-third inch wide black aluminum tape was installed at regular intervals over the location of internal radiator lines along the circumference of the adapter in order to reduce solar reflectivity. Ground testing had indicated that these interior radiators were allowing too much heat to escape into space, and NASA, up to now, was concerned about the potential of this system overperforming. But thanks to the long-duration missions of Gemini 5 and Gemini 7, NASA understands more about how the spacecraft cooling system works in flight, and alters it somewhat, switching to a more compact layout of black Velcro 
in order to make room for the installation of external handholds for future, more ambitious spacewalks. Now one minute and 35 seconds and counting. We'll get the ignition of the Atlas vehicle at about four seconds and expected liftoff at zero of the 95 minute mark in the simultaneous count. Now T minus 20 seconds and counting. T minus 18 holding momentarily, now resuming the count. T minus 15, T minus 11, 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, 4, 3. We have ignition. completed our planned hole and now proceeding down to the final moments leading up to an ignition of the Gemini launch vehicle at 40 minutes and 59 seconds past the hour. The Mod 3 radio command guidance system now has fed the final flight parameters into the launch vehicle and spacecraft. We will be uh, launched on an azimuth of 99.9 .9 degrees. Now two minutes and 30 seconds and counting. During this phase of the countdown and over the final five minutes, just about all sequences monitored in the blockhouse are worked automatically as far as the launch vehicle is concerned. We're on an automatic sequence and we're checking the various events as they click off during these final phases. Now T minus two minutes and eight seconds and counting. This is Gemini Launch Control. We do have a clearance for a launch. The stage one fuel pre-valves have been opened. This permits the fuel to feed down just above the thrust chamber of the launch vehicle. For the first time, a complete Agena target vehicle inserts itself successfully into a circular orbit and lies in wait for a Gemini spacecraft. The plan was coming together. The time was now. Four, three, two, one, zero. We have ignition. And we have a lift off. On the ground, an experienced and battle-hardened Gemini flight control team now works with a novice Agena team, now watching for the first time over their vehicle. All the while, remote site computer systems are running brand new software. Gemini 8 seemed like a new day. Indeed, the launch was flawless, and just as Shara and Stafford had done, Armstrong and Scott begin their orbital waltz towards destiny. One small issue that makes rendezvous all the more difficult is the fact that when the thrusters are fired, they don't cut off instantly. They spittle out, adding small extra packets of acceleration known as a tail-off residual. This means a burn meant to add a definite velocity might add a couple extra percentage points. Spotty radio coverage, simply a reality of early orbital flight, also compounds things. At the conclusion of one of their maneuvers, a request to add an extra knot to their velocity comes so late, Armstrong has less than a minute to get ready. He performs the burn manually. Roger, do you have solid radar lock on with the Agena? Over. Affirmative, we have solid radar lock. Uh, just a second, I'll give you our current range. 
Roger, thank you. Sounds good. Uh, we're indicating 158 miles range and elevation of about 4 degrees. There you go, partner. You done it, boy. You done a good job. Do your thing. Boy, look at that sucker. That's beautiful. Need the dipole? Do I ever? I see everything with that color. Man, that's great. Man, that is really cool. Look. A bit of all right. Okay, the first thing we really have to do, platform parallelism, 650 to 710. And they're giving us the SPC loaded yaw maneuver. It looks like that nominal time. So they're going to give you that time. I'll check your own status at this point, boy. I bet those Lockheed guys are just jumping up and down. Yes, Tan, it's on. Yeah. Okay. It's very easy to maneuver around the vicinity of another spacecraft, easier than we had expected it to be. Terminator White, go ahead. We'd like to know when you first saw the acquisition lights as you approach. We think it was 45 miles, but we'll have to check on the tape. Roger, copy, and uh, ready to copy the readouts if you have it now. From the ground, time-tagged transmissions called stored program commands are sent to the Agena in order for it to maneuver itself. Once docked to the Gemini spacecraft, the astronauts can send commands directly through the command link system via a hardline umbilical. They can also transmit radio frequency commands when in immediate proximity. A pyrotechnically deployed index bar sticks out of the nose of the Gemini spacecraft, designed to slot into a cutout on the Agena docking collar, which allows the astronauts to determine the proper roll angle of the two vehicles prior to docking. Flexible metal fingers protrude from inside the Agena docking collar, brushing against the Gemini spacecraft and equalizing the electrical potential between the two vehicles. Latches snap into place, forming a soft dock between the collar section itself and the Gemini spacecraft. Then, electric motors retract the collar further into the cigar-shaped Agena, rigidizing the two vehicles which now, thanks to Neil Armstrong's piloting, are effectively one. Operating two dissimilar vehicles as one combined spacecraft is something NASA has never done before, but will be crucial in Apollo. Part of that means ensuring the control system computer on the Agena is responding to and aligned with the astronaut-controlled Gemini spacecraft computer. Both vehicles have independent maneuvering systems, and the astronauts, in order to conserve fuel on their own vehicle, can use the Agena's thrusters to perform attitude maneuver changes, sending commands through their own computer via hard link through the docking system into the Agena. During this time, Gemini 8 drifts in and out of voice contact, passing over Africa and the Indian Ocean, NASA's most remote stations, some of which offer only voice contact and not spacecraft telemetry. David Scott commands the Agena to make a 90-degree yaw, which it dutifully executes. As the two astronauts are reviewing their checklists, Scott notices, either through a check of the horizon or his onboard instruments, that the combined spacecraft is in a 30-degree left bank. Armstrong agrees. He uses his hand controller, utilizing the onboard thrusters to maneuver back to the target attitude. And when he lets go, the roll begins again. The pair had been docked for nearly 30 minutes. It was now seven hours into the mission of Gemini 8. At first, the mysterious impulse is intermittent. The vehicle holds, and then begins once again to turn. Both astronauts suspect a problem with the Agena, and they decide to turn its attitude maneuvering system off. David Scott commands ACS off to no effect. The roll continues. He then shuts off the horizon sensors. Still, no change. They were now in a continuous roll of 15 degrees per second. Armstrong activates manual mode on the Gemini's thrusters. He switches to rate command mode and successfully nulls the velocities. Their spacecraft is hemorrhaging fuel. Armstrong brings Gemini 8 back into pulse mode and rotation begins to aggressively build once again. Finally, he switches back into rate command and the roll rates cease. 
For approximately five minutes, the two vehicles are seemingly stable. It was now seven hours, seven minutes into their mission. Neither astronaut has any idea what is happening, but just 20 seconds later, it happens again. An unexpected left roll begins to build, and while Armstrong fights it, Scott begins running through procedures to separate from the Agena. He cycles the AGS power multiple times, and with no change, Armstrong orders the undocking. Scott, in a remarkable display of awareness, switches the Agena's computer back to ground command, and then hits the emergency release as Armstrong fires the Gemini thrusters backwards in a long burst. The Gemini spacecraft, now much lighter, begins to spin much faster. It became immediately clear to the horror of the astronauts that they had just made their problem much worse. The issue was with their vehicle, not the Agena. Uh, CSQ at telemetry AOS on Agena and Gemini. Roger. How's it look? Well, we're indicating spacecraft free here. I'm going to call the crew now. CSQ, Capcom, contact out of your Well, we got serious problems here. We're going to put a couple of hands over here, but uh, we're disengaged from the Agena. Okay. Uh, we got your spacecraft free indication here. We're rolling up and we can't turn anything off. CSQ flight. I have flight. Did he say he could not turn the Agena off? No, he says he is separated from the Agena and he's in a roll and he can't stop it. His reg, pre his reg pressure is down to zero. His arm is regulating pressure. Say again. We can't fire up and we can't fire up. We apparently have a roll. Armstrong and Scott fight for their lives as the spacecraft builds up a runaway tumble. 30 seconds after undocking, the vehicle is now spinning at an incredible 300 degrees per second. Both astronauts are beginning to suffer from vertigo. Tunnel vision sets in. The edges of their sight becomes blurry. If the rates get too high, they'll pass out. Armstrong activates the re-entry control system, the ring thrusters and the nose of the vehicle, which have their own independent circuitry and fuel supply. He tries to fight the rotation and is shocked to find no response. When you copy flight, they seem to have a uh, stuck thruster. Uh, they have initiated a squiz and blown them, but they can't seem to stop it or get them working. Did I hear a stuck hand controller? Did I hear him say he may have a stuck hand controller? That's permanent flight. Scott looks up above his head and realizes that somehow the relevant circuit breakers had been opened. He closes them, and immediately the RCS responds to Armstrong's inputs. Out of flight, this is CSQ. We can't seem to get any uh, valid data here. He seems to be in a pretty violent tumble rate. It takes nearly six minutes, but Armstrong eating through 75% of his re-entry fuel, finally manages to stop the tumbling. During this time, mission control is helpless. The crippled spacecraft and endangered crew, now passing over remote sections of the Pacific Ocean, can only offer brief, garbled transmissions. Common sense now demands an immediate mission abort at the nearest opportunity. Now we've lost considerable gas pressure and Let's get that uh, spacecraft C-band beacon on. Re-entry C-band beacon on. Uh, we've lost contact with the spacecraft flight. Okay, we'll get him over Hawaii. Meanwhile, in orbit, Armstrong and Scott, waiting for their next voice contact, begin slowly testing thrusters one by one, isolating them via circuit breakers and using the little orbital maneuvering fuel they have left to try and determine what had happened. As they close the breaker for thruster number eight, which imparts counterclockwise roll, the jet begins to fire without any input from the crew. The mission of Gemini 8 had been crippled 
by thruster aid. Okay, we have uh, 22% showing in the gauge. Uh, we uh, don't have any uh, yaw or, uh, or roll control, or any control of the yaw thrusters, apparently none of them. Uh, we do have, uh, apparently the pitch thrusters are operative. And uh, we're now uh, in roll, and roll jets and pitch jets are in roll, so we're slowly getting uh, back to a proper attitude here. Ten, nine, eight, seven, six, five, four, three, two, one, retrofire. Roger, copy, auto retro, four retros. TSQ, Capcom, Houston flight. Go ahead, by TSQ. Roger, we'd like you to go up about every 30 seconds during blackout to see if you can get any calm here. The, oh, predicted, Roger, we'll the predicted blackout time, Jim, is about 60 seconds prior to your acquisition and extends until about 60 seconds after your LOS, so I don't think you're going to have any joy. Uh, Roger, I got it. I got it here at about 1029.30 to 1034.48. Roger. Armstrong and Scott bring Gemini 8 home after just ten and a half hours of flight. Splashing down at one of the contingency landing sites in the middle of the western Pacific Ocean, south of Japan and nearly 500 nautical miles east of Okinawa. With the original planned splashdown point being in the West Atlantic, it remains the furthest distance from the pre-mission splashdown area of any NASA vehicle. Gemini 8's Agena which remains in orbit, is able to be remotely commanded thanks to Scott's last-minute input. And nearly 5,000 successful commands are executed before it is decommissioned. Armstrong and Scott are bobbing in the ocean for three hours before recovery forces reach them. The seasick astronauts are rescued, and the process of finding out what had gone wrong with Thruster 8 begins. At the McDonnell plant, it is concluded that the errant thruster activity was likely the result of an electrical short rather than a mechanical failure. A rewiring fix would be required to prevent something like this from ever happening again. Gemini 8 was a close call and a successful failure. America had achieved the first ever docking in space, but they had not been able to complete any of their EVA objectives. That makes things going forward rather complex, because the U.S. Air Force, then working on their own manned spaceflight program, which would use Gemini hardware for the purpose of building a military space station in low Earth orbit, called the Manned Orbiting Laboratory, or MOLE, wants NASA to test a prototype jetpack on Gemini 9, called the Astronaut Maneuvering Unit, or AMU. At this time, NASA and the Air Force have concurrent human spaceflight programs. It is believed, once NASA is finished with Project Gemini, the Air Force will continue developing the platform, using heavier iterations of the Titan rocket and perhaps even incorporating aerodynamic improvements such as a lifting wing. Eventually, the Air Force wants to use the Titan rocket family to man a series of surveillance stations in orbit. While their own vehicle, the X-20, was cancelled in 1963, through the mid-1960s the Gemini spacecraft was their next best bet. NASA, while focused on perfecting techniques for lunar exploration, is forced to support some of the Air Force's test objectives, including test flying the AMU. It is a rare intrusion of the U.S. military into NASA's civil prerogative. Manned Orbiting Laboratory will eventually be cancelled altogether. However, despite the failures of any EVA objectives aboard Gemini 8, NASA charges headlong towards flying the AMU on Gemini 9, despite having only 20 minutes of spacewalking experience more than 10 months ago. Project Gemini continues along at a dizzying pace. The turnaround between 8 and 9 is just two months. In those days, we were moving so fast, we were launching a mission every two months as we were approaching the end of the decade and we had to fulfill the pledge uh, that we had made to uh, President Kennedy that, that uh, only the most significant events stood out and uh, you would find some way to, 
to uh, reshape the mission to accommodate uh, the lessons learned. The mission of Gemini 9, which will be flown by the original backups, Stafford and Cernan, following the untimely death of the prime crew Bassett and C, is yet another swing for the fences. First, a new Agena will be launched into low Earth orbit. Second, Stafford and Cernan will launch into space just one orbit later, and immediately begin maneuvers for a rendezvous much earlier in the timeline than had been done previously. NASA is interested in reducing the coast time, thereby minimizing the potential for error or stranding in the context of a critical lunar orbit rendezvous in Apollo. The faster they can bring the two vehicles together, the better. Furthermore, NASA wants to test the efficacy of optical tracking in approaches from above. In other words, should the illuminated lunar surface be behind either of the two spacecraft, would that affect the ability of the astronauts to spot and track it in space? Such things would need to be tested, and the mission of Gemini 9 would be to perform three different rendezvous techniques. Then, later in the mission, Cernan will perform a spacewalk, moving to the back of the Gemini spacecraft and retrieving the Air Force AMU, conducting a jetpack-powered flight while tethered to his vehicle. One thing that has many NASA engineers worried is the fact that the AMU uses hot-firing thrusters of hydrogen peroxide. Sustained blasts impinging off of Cernan's suit may be damaging. It is, to say the least, a controversial mission objective among NASA's ranks. 10.12 a.m., May 17, 1966. T-minus 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1. The Atlas Agena rises into the sky ahead of Gemini 9. During the launch, a pinched wire in the Atlas booster rocket creates an electrical short, forcing one of the outboard engines hard over and causing the vehicle to come tumbling back down to Earth. Said that we do not have any definite word on our bird, but it does not look good at this time. Six minutes. Coming up on seven minutes into the flight. An electrical short and tumbling. Sound familiar? It seemed like NASA was haunted. They could not shake this monkey off their back. Gemini 9's launch is scrubbed, but there is little standing around. The next day, the backup augmented target adapter, made for just such a case, is declared the new rendezvous target for a remanifested Gemini 9A. The momentum during these days of peak NASA activity is disorienting, to say the least. During this time, too, other departments at NASA are busy conducting unmanned test flights for Apollo. The backup ATDA is mounted on yet another Atlas rocket, and quickly prepared for a June 1st launch. Ninety minutes later, Stafford and Cernan, having been in their spacecraft for hours on two different occasions now, have to scrub yet again due to ground control issues. The ATDA passes over, another opportunity lost. The mission of Gemini 9A is postponed 48 hours. They can't afford to delay any longer, and with the ATDA in at the very least a stable orbit, Gemini 9A charges ahead on June 3rd. Countdown from three, 
seconds thereafter, liftoff will come. During that period, there will be a period of about 1.8 seconds where we possibly will have the capability of shutting down if necessary. Five, four, three, two, one, zero. Ignition. We have ignition. Liftoff. We have a liftoff. Oh, Looks like 39 oh, minutes, 32 seconds after the hour. Roll program initiated on time. Roger, roll. Roll complete. Roll complete. Pitch program initiated. Roger on the pitch. T plus 17 seconds. Flight dynamics reports the thrust looks good. Uh, the spacecraft and its booster are moving at 740 miles per hour. We are now reaching for four nautical miles in altitude. Uh, we didn't copy that, Tom. Sure, we got the sign in the right, so keep us close to that right, Neil. Oh, okay, I got you now. The spacecraft is now approximately eight nautical miles in altitude. The track looks good. We are about five nautical miles downrange. Advise no DCS updates now. Roger, negative DCS updates. T plus two minutes, 20 seconds. The flight crew have been notified that they are go for staging. And we had a beautiful fireball staging go. Roger. Oh, that's fantastic. You are go for Ivar. Go. Ivar. Insertion Velocity Adjust Routine. A new maneuver designed to help facilitate a more rapid rendezvous, shaving an entire orbit off their coast. Just three hours and 20 minutes after launch, their target vehicle comes into view. After about 150 nautical miles, uh, if you had any uh, acqui <coughs> radar acquisition blinking yet? Houston 29. Yes, Houston, go ahead. Uh, roger, proposal of radar lock on. Uh, roger, uh, can you read out uh, uh, range, please? We're 129.45 miles, and we'll get you a range right shortly. Roger. NASA sends remote commands to the ATDA, forcing rapid attitude maneuvers to try and shake the fairing loose to no avail. Stafford and Cernan won't be able to dock unless they find a way to get the obstruction off safely. Okay, okay rigidizing now. It's all moving. It's moving all around. You rigidize the clamshell. The alligator jaws came close slightly. Roger. Okay, on rigid eyes. Hey, the whole mass rotates about 15 degrees on it. Okay, that's a pretty good uh, signal then. Uh, we'll go ahead, plan on going ahead with a separation burn at this point. Okay, Neil. I've been positioned to start a line. In the meantime, they begin making preparations for their second rendezvous maneuver. This one, called an equiperiod rendezvous, 
involves a simple outward pulse away from the Earth, requiring only periodic braking, gravity, and time to bring the vehicle back into proximity in just one orbit. It worked like a dream. NASA seems to be getting good at rendezvous, their navigation in low Earth orbit proving exceptional, reliable, and repeatable. But time and time again, the ambition of these flights is plagued by either systems failures or human error. In this case, miscommunication between contractors Douglas, Lockheed, and McDonnell resulted in the failure of ground technicians to properly install lanyards responsible for detaching the electrical connectors to the explosive bolts. Those bolts had indeed fired, but the wiring, bound around the base of the fairing, held the shroud bands in place. It had been improperly installed. They had simply taped the loose ends of the lanyards down instead of actually connecting them. All of this stemmed from the fact that the fairing was missing a key component of its original design, the absent Agena stage. The procedures developed for jury-rigging it to the Atlas were not effectively communicated across teams. Furthermore, a contributing factor was arrogance. The McDonnell team refused Douglas and Lockheed oversight of a procedure with which they were not familiar. Stafford and Cernan, as well as the backup crew pilot Buzz Aldrin, are itching for the chance to use unconventional means of knocking the fairing loose. Stafford wants to bump it with the nose of the Gemini spacecraft. Aldrin floats the idea of having Cernan go EVA to cut the wires holding it together manually. Most, if not all, of Mission Control takes a pretty firm stand against these explorations. The large fairings, with sharp edges and possibly under tension, could crush Cernan's arm or slice his suit. They pose an imminent danger to the Gemini 9 spacecraft and its crew. The docking is a bust. That leaves just the third and final rendezvous maneuver, and Cernan's planned spacewalk. As flight day one comes to a close, the pair settle down to get a fitful few hours of sleep. On flight day two, the pair begin to make their third and final experimental approach, this time from above. The goal is to see just how effective the human eye is in manually tracking the rendezvous target when the surface of a celestial body is moving behind it. 21 hours into flight, Gemini 9 approaches its mark. At a distance of just 20 nautical miles, the crew sights the ATDA, but they lose it intermittently. Relying on radar data, they close to within three nautical miles, and to their amazement, still have trouble making it out with the brilliant Earth coasting by below. Against the backdrop of the blackness of space, the crew were able to easily guide themselves in using eyesight. From the other direction, however, it was not so easy. The experience gained on Gemini 9 prevents the rendezvous radar system from being eliminated from the lunar module in Apollo at a time when its necessity was in question. A radar system had already been removed from the command module. Both astronauts of Gemini 9 feel that without their radar, they wouldn't have been able to make it. As per the flight plan, Cernan is supposed to be gearing up for his spacewalk soon. But with an at-best fitful first sleep period, a lack of eating, and the frustration associated with the loss of their docking objective, the crew are exhausted. On the ground, debates in mission control rage on about whether to attempt an ad hoc EVA to salvage the fairing. Officially, NASA management greenlights the dangerous gamble, despite fierce resistance from Flight Director Gene Krantz. It is, in fact, Commander Tom Stafford who decides to wave off, postponing any EVA activity for tomorrow. It's going to take us about a few to stay here for EVA for three hours. Right, you understand. Stand by one, I'll talk to flight. Tell him to stay with it until we get to the stake. We'll break okay. it fully, go ahead with his EVA prep. Uh, gave us a summary which went something like this. We're pretty well bushed. And he also raised for the 
first time. Some uh, question in his own mind, having talked it over, he said, with Gene Cernan, he questioned uh, whether, uh, whether and when the EVA should be done. It was his suggestion that perhaps it sh the EVA event should wait until tomorrow morning. He realized there were alternatives, however, that... Uh, some experiments could be done, and he qualified it by saying, unless you, we have a specific plan for the ATDA suggesting the release of the, the shroud and uh, suggesting uh, go ahead with some docking practice, he uh, questioned the, the need for EVA uh, as presently planned for 25 hours and 10 minutes. His authority as mission commander is nearly absolute. And if NASA management is truly set on attempting to free the Shroud, it would mean performing a fourth rendezvous not in the flight plan. Whether he knew it or not, Stafford has just performed a brilliant piece of chess, successfully mitigating the risky operation by delaying it long enough to effectively cancel it without explicitly doing so. Uh, Roger, we're going to have plenty of documentary evidence as to what caused the failure. Uh, Roger, nine. we're uh, in the process right now of turning the L band off for you. Flight Day 3. 49 hours into their mission, Stafford and Cernan, now alone, enter final preparations for Cernan's spacewalk. No ad hoc rescue required. This one will be by the book. Over the Canary Station a few minutes ago, Tom Stafford reported, we've got the big snake out of the black box. This was a reference to uh, having removed the umbilical, the 25-foot umbilical, from its stowage place. Despite all of NASA's gained experience over these last few months, this is only their second spacewalk ever conducted. Like as planned for the original Gemini 6, thanks to external oxygen supplies, the spacewalk can be many times longer than Ed White's, up to nearly two and a half hours if necessary. The exclusion of ATDA-related objectives means that most likely it won't be for the full duration. Cernan pops the hatch and begins to float outside the vehicle. Ed White, on Gemini 4, had been carefree if not elated on his spacewalk. His 23-minute floating experience filled many at NASA with a false confidence. However, Cernan's EVA involves actual work. He must use a series of handholds to maneuver around to the aft end of the spacecraft and attach himself to the AMU, retrieving a meteoroid experiment in the process and investigating zero-g behavior of a 25-foot umbilical tether that keeps him attached to Gemini 9. Cernan finds the handholds inadequate as he fights the snake-like tether, crawling his way hand over hand towards the back of the spacecraft. He fights and brute forces. He moves quickly and soon learns that any impulse of his body is met with resistance in the suit and imparts rotational momentum. He's quickly breathing hard and perspiring, fighting to get back to where he needs to be. Once Cernan arrives at the AMU, he begins to prepare it for use. Every move he makes seems to push him away. He simply has no leverage. To compound the problem, several lights located in the area designed to help him see are not working. And as the sun begins to set, the heat energy coming off of his body results in condensation over his visor in the air-cooled suit. At night, in darkness, with a fogged visor, he cannot see a thing. That quantity is good. He's right on the nominal. How you doing, Jim? Hey, 
This is Germany Control, Houston. Immediately after the Carnarvon Pass, we had the following report from the surgeon. He said coming into the Carnarvon area, Gene Cernan was showing a heart rate of 160, 160. After taking a rest, Cernan struggles to deal with his fogged faceplate visor. He angles himself towards the sun, trying to clear the fog. Sweat was now pouring into Cernan's eyes, with no way to wipe them dry. Stafford makes the call. After just over two hours, Cernan must end his EVA without performing any AMU-related objectives. Hello, Houston, 79. 79, Hawaii. Roger, Hawaii, I want you to relay the Houston message. Roger, go ahead. About four or five times more work than what we anticipated, and the pilot visor is completely fogged over, nearly frozen over. Well, that he stay there and just relax. I'm also on communication in the very far. He has a lot of trouble. The heavy dreams of this thing can barely reach. Also, the attitude control the arm is not untouched completely. If the situation doesn't improve, also is having trouble getting the restraint on this hooked up. I'm going to call it a no-go on the AMU. You're going to stay here and rest for a while. If you get to the block, we'll take a quick look at it. It doesn't this is Germany Control, Houston. The Stafford has just been on the line, and he says that he uh, has decided the situation is no-go, no-go for the AMU. He says Cernan's visor is still fogged over. He also says the transmitter from the AMU is so garbled that he has great difficulty in reading Gene, and he has directed Gene Cernan to uh, switch back to the spacecraft umbilical and they'll take another look at the situation. Yep, I'm gonna try and get out of this thing now if I can. Okay. It's still fogged up. Okay. Hey, Neil, you might uh, tell everyone down there that's concerned. Uh, I'm so sure sorry about this. This spacewalk had been a reality check for NASA. Demonstrating that they had not, in fact, mastered the art of spacewalking, not even close. They had a lot to learn. Throughout their mission, Stafford and Cernan also manage a small number of onboard science experiments, including the measurement of UHF-VHF polarization to map the electron field around the spacecraft in the orbital environment. They also conducted air glow and zodiacal light photography. On June 6, after three days in space, Stafford and Cernan return home splashing down in the western Atlantic, northeast of the Bahama Islands. Ten seconds away. Eight, seven, six, five, four, three, two, one. Retrofire. Gemini 9 is largely perceived as a failure, though it solidifies NASA's grasp on rendezvous techniques. Cernan's very public spacewalk difficulties thrusts EVA into the limelight. What had been seen as a hill that had already been summited was now under question. It was clear that EVA needed to be a focus of the remaining Gemini missions, of which there were now only three. NASA had burned through much of its hardware, and the first manned flights in Apollo were rapidly approaching. Gene Krantz, Chris Kraft and John Hodge, the original flight directors for Gemini had, by now, one after another, moved towards work on Apollo, the third chapter of America's March to the Moon. In their stead, they leave behind junior flight directors Glenn Lunny and Cliff Charlesworth and the seasoned men of Mission Control to fly just three final missions that must each in their own way resolve the frustrations and answer the questions that yet remained. At this time, I'd like to introduce NASA's Deputy Administrator, Dr. Robert Siemens, Jr. We have just awarded both astronauts the NASA Exceptional Service Medal. We found that there, were, there are still unforeseen difficulties to be overcome before we can operate at 100% efficiency in the space environment. As you know, some of these difficulties were procedural. 
such as the faulty cabling of the shroud covering the docking adapter. Others were new and could only be experienced in space, such as the unanticipated expenditure of effort required by extravehicular activities. This extra effort on Gene's part saturated the suit environment system and led to the fogging of his face plate. This experience points up something we tend to forget. As an experimental program, we try on each flight to advance to a maximum extent our understanding of space and how to operate in it. Quite often we've learned things we had not expected, and that is as it should be in an experimental program, and provides key data points in time for incorporation into Apollo planning. We have thus far accomplished a great deal in some areas, a good deal more than we might have expected, for example, in orbital maneuvering and rendezvous. However, there's still a good deal to learn in some other areas, as for example, operation in a dock mode and in manned operation outside the spacecraft. As the spring of 1966 turns to summer, several changes are made as a result of the experiences of Gemini 8 and Gemini 9. Gemini 10, which will be flown by veteran astronaut John Young, U.S. Navy commander. This is his second spaceflight, having flown Gemini 3 with Gus Grissom. His pilot will be first-timer Michael Collins, an Air Force major. Since neither Gemini 6, Gemini 8, or Gemini 9 had accomplished the long-desired objective of conducting combined maneuvers when docked with the Agena, NASA, with only two target vehicles left, reactivates Agena 5001, which was originally a test article and not slated for flight. This older model will eventually be paired with Gemini 12. July 18th, 1966. Only a month and a half after Gemini 9, an Atlas Agena once again stands ready on the pad in support of Gemini 10. NASA had been through this dance so many times before. Would it work this time? Another failure would call the entire program into serious question. Young and Collins will rendezvous and dock with Agena 10, and if all goes well, they will command the Agena's engine to perform a docked burn, maneuvering the stack into position for a second rendezvous with Agena 8, still in orbit, and thanks to the post-incident ground commands, now stable. Five, four, three, two, one, ignition. And we've got a liftoff, and it looks like 46 seconds after the hour. Plus 12 seconds. Trajectory is good, and so is range safety. Seconds and we have completed now a 20, 30 second period of steering, uh, which went very nicely. On paper, the Agena engine is meant to be used to boost the Gemini Agena stack into a high elliptical orbit of the Earth. But there's worry among the contractors and NASA that this would place the spacecraft and crew in an orbit from which they might not be able to return should their retro rockets fail. Biko. Beco programmed at 2 minutes 11 seconds. It looked like it occurred right on the mark. The booster engines have dropped away. NASA doesn't rule out the high orbit mission completely, but wants to first get flight experience in combined spacecraft maneuvering. T minus 40 seconds and counting. During these final moments of the count, the pre valves in the launch vehicle will open to permit the fuel and the oxidizer to come down toward the chamber of the vehicle. 30 seconds and counting. T minus 20. Quick check on the blockhouse, all systems looking good. T minus 15. T minus 10, 9, 
eight, seven, six, five, four, three, two, one, zero. Ignition. Ignition. Ignition and we've got a lift off. We have confirmation that the clock did start. Cool program has started. Uh, Roger on roll. Thrust looks good. T plus 20 seconds. Roll program complete. Roll program complete. Roger. And the pitch program has started. Okay. Looking mighty good. 35 seconds into the flight. Jordan Cooper advises the crew they're looking mighty good. We have the proper rolling pitch programs in and both guidance systems are go. 50 seconds. Kevin ceiling at uh, 5.7 pounds. Oh, Mark one minute. Uh, roger. Ground and spacecraft clocks are in sync. Roger 10, you're go for staging. Roger, you're going go for staging. Roger. And the crew has been given a go for staging and 10 is go for staging, young reports. Two minutes, 20 seconds. Uh, go, good go. Roger. And we've got second, first stage cut off. Light Thrust dynamics confirm staging. Everything looks good from here. And second stage uh, thrust yeah. looks good. Yeah, you're right on the lines there. After a successful Agena target vehicle insertion into orbit, only the second ever, Gemini 10 climbs into the evening sky. During staging, impingement from the plume of the LR-91 engine causes the first stage oxidizer tank to explode, momentarily enshrouding the spacecraft with fire and causing a brilliant light show clearly visible from the ground. This is Gemini Control Houston. Cooper has established voice contact with Young. He said simply, are you there yet? And Young said, Roger, we're there. This would indicate to us that they are station keeping and closing on the Agena, probably very slightly. Collins uses a sextant to sight on selected stars, but interference from atmospheric airglow makes his job way more difficult than he had expected. They would have to use ground-based computer data for the rendezvous instead. Young and Collins overshoot the Agena, and end up two miles out of plane, two miles low, and no longer headed in the right direction. Young has to make a last-minute mid-course correction that uses nearly 400 pounds of orbital maneuvering fuel. With only 36% now remaining, this embarrassing hiccup forces the cancellation of further practice dockings. They would have only one chance, and would have to rely on their Agena for further orbital maneuvers. Young and Collins snake their way in, and just under six hours after launch, successfully dock with Agena 10. No oscillations are reported between the two vehicles as the connection is rigidized. A sigh of relief is breathed out on the ground, but the memory of Gemini 8 still haunts the Moker. It's very likely now that we will exercise an option available to us, a pre-planned option, after the big PPS burn and after the sleep period tomorrow. It looks very much now like we would remain docked to the Agena during the stand-up EVA exercise tomorrow afternoon. Everyone remains vigilant as the commands are sent into the Agena through the Gemini spacecraft via hardline. Mike Collins punches in the codes. 041-571-450-521-501. Fire. And the big engine has initiated. The big engine is firing. And the primary propulsion system has shut down. Wild, huh? When that baby lights, there's no doubt about it. You're trying to tell me something. We got a real spectacular tail off going right now. And Fendel has just called the crew, and John Young came back. That was really something. Uh, that was very spectacular. The tail off at the big one. I understand. 
The astronauts call it eyeballs out. Young and Collins are accelerated backwards, pushed against their straps as the Agena blasts the Gemini spacecraft to a world record orbit with an apogee of 411 nautical miles, the highest, fastest, and furthest any humans had ever been. This wasn't as high as Agena could promise, however. It was simply to set the right orbital conditions and begin the long coast towards Agena 8, longer than any mission had previously required. Nevertheless, one and a half times higher than the orbit of the Hubble Space Telescope, Young and Collins get a view of the Earth starkly different than any mission had before advice uh, from the uh, Capcom to the crew to keep their head within the cockpit during a certain time period. This is in reference to a um, French nuclear test that was conducted this morning. The spacecraft was to pass over the location of the test. However, uh, this country and France uh, had coordinated on both the test and the uh, flight, but as an extra precaution, we wanted the crew to uh, not look outside at uh, this certain time. Now, I, as it turned out, the test had already been conducted, so there was would have been no problem. The pair end their first day in space on a high note. They were docked to Agena 10. They were moving towards Agena 8, and they had performed the first successful maneuver of a combined spacecraft in orbit, and had set new world altitude and speed records. All of these things overshadow the disappointment of the fuel-heavy rendezvous, but there was still much to be done. On flight day two, the pair fire the Agena's engine up again, and then use its secondary propulsion system for final corrections as they begin the terminal approach to Agena 8. Several people have remarked here on the extraordinary versatility of the Agena, which has proved itself beyond the fondest hope during this period of nearly 24 hours now, where it's been the primary maneuvering system, both in the very discreet small type burns as we just saw over Hawaii, and of course in the large primary propulsion system burn, truly remarkably stable in all of its rates, and the performance has been uh, precisely as advertised. Mike Collins prepares for the first of his scheduled multiple spacewalks. This one is fairly straightforward, simply called a stand-up EVA. He will remain at the spacecraft with his legs still in the cabin as he positions his upper body out into space and operates an ultraviolet camera to study cosmic UV signatures. Both astronauts begin to suffer mysterious irritation in their eyes during the spacewalk. Collins is nearly complete with his photography objectives, but has to cancel the last batch when Commander Young terminates the EVA after just 49 minutes. The crew initially suspect the anti-fog compound inside their faceplates, but it's later believed that their suit fans were the cause. Both oxygen compressors were simultaneously activated. The pair turn one of the fans in the spacecraft off and prepare for yet another rest period. Flight Day 3. The two make their final maneuvers on Agena 10. Just 15 minutes prior to making the burn, John Young notices their attitude is backwards due to a faulty star sighting. Another blow to optical navigation. After making the 180 degree turnaround, the pair successfully enter the terminal phase. Agena 8 was completely electrically dead. No running lights, no radar transponder. The pair would have to rely on their eyes and skill for the final approach. They undock from Agena 10 and begin looking out into space for Agena 8. The pair activate their docking lights, and down to just 15% fuel, they park themselves successfully behind Gemini 8's target vehicle. 
Mike Collins hooks up a massive 50-foot tether to himself and begins his second spacewalk. This is Houston. The hatch is open. Collins is leaving the spacecraft. We estimate that the hatch opened at an elapsed time of 48 hours, 42 minutes. We'll go back and monitor for uh, the first conversation outside. And our flight surgeon, Dr. Berry, advises that uh, Mike Collins' heart rate presently is reading 110 beats per minute. He said as he left the spacecraft, it was up about 130, settled down immediately, presently showing about 110. Cernan's experience had canceled all further AMU testing, and like Ed White on Gemini 4, Collins instead uses a handheld zip gun for maneuvering. He works his way back to the adapter section, retrieving fuel for the gun and exposing more micrometeoroid experiments. Then, when all is ready, with Young holding Gemini 10 in stable position, Collins pushes himself off and begins floating towards Agena 8. He grasps for the docking cone, but quickly slips off. He uses the gun to impulse back towards the Agena. He dislodges part of the docking apparatus, an electric discharge ring, and fears it could sever his umbilical if he maneuvers too quickly. Acting with extreme caution, he retrieves an experiment package off of Agena 8. His momentum, and the presence of the now exposed sharp metal, leads him to conclude that he is unable to safely install a replacement, part of his mission objectives. Instead, he uses the zip gun to maneuver back to Gemini 10 and hands the old experiment off to Young. Collins snags his foot and begins tumbling end over end. He uses the zip gun to correct, but in the process, imparts kinetic energy into the Agena, which causes it to begin slowly gyrating. We think we better uh, not pull it anymore. We can okay, concur. we'll concur with that. Tell him not to spend any more fuel trying to stay with the Agena. Okay. Okay, I really uh, We're not saving much fuel in right command with uh, Mike out there bumping things. Young's station keeping had consumed yet more of the already preciously low fuel. After just 30 minutes, Mission Control brings the hammer down and demands a cessation of any further maneuvering by Young. Young, in turn, then decides to end the EVA. Collins pulls himself back into the Gemini via his own umbilical, and the pair begin wrestling with the sinuous monster, having to simultaneously untangle Collins and stow the tether itself. Line positioning uh, is indeed a problem. Uh, although the nitrogen line got connected without too much of a problem, I, when I translated over to the Agena, I found that the lack of handles is a big impediment. I, would, I could hang on, but I couldn't get around to the other side, which is where I wanted to get around to. Oh, Roger, we, uh, you can't believe why we got to talk here with us, but uh, what all it is turned off the radio. We just found out. Roger, that's what we expected. We also noticed you uh, turned off your yaw rate gyro and your C-band beacon circuit breaker. It is only after the spacewalk that both Collins and Young realize that each of them has lost something. Collins' Hasselblad camera has somehow detached from his chest bracket and had floated off into space. Young had lost the adapter section's micrometeoroid experiment. The pair are exasperated at how difficult EVA had proven to be. Gemini 10 is not the resounding spacewalk success that many at NASA had hoped though it had certainly been smoother than Gemini 9. Uh, Gemini 10, Houston, how was uh, the hatch closing? It was uh, a bit of power, a piece of cake. Good. An hour later, the pair eject the EVA hardware, including the umbilical, making more room in their already cramped cockpit. They perform one final orbital maneuver, positioning themselves for a re-entry the next day. Their three-day mission was now at an end. Six, five, four, three, two, one, retrofire.
Now, Roger, Jiminy 10, looks good. Chris Kraft said just a minute ago, we should be right on the money. Collins and Young splashed down 3.4 nautical miles away from the USS Guadalcanal. One thing that has consistently improved with each mission. One interesting note is the crew's worn radiation dosimeters. The pair had, in their high orbit, flown through the South Atlantic Anomaly, a mysterious region where the Van Allen belts, which are areas of ionizing radiation surrounding Earth, come closest to our planet's surface. Their three-day mission and a Gina transfer orbit had exposed them to much more radiation than would be experienced even in Apollo. Young's absorbed dose was 670 millirads, some 23 times more radiation than the next crew, which would also be boosted into a high orbit. It was now late summer 1966, and Gemini had just two missions remaining. A full-scale exodus into Apollo-related projects had now begun, and Project Gemini found itself increasingly stripped of the people who had started it and were there during its toughest lessons. These final flights would have a heavy EVA focus. Cernan and Collins had proven that EVAs with actual workloads were no joke, and NASA was keen on developing new methods and strategies to deal with the problems associated with spacewalking, ideally before committing astronauts to lunar surface exploration, a new and hostile environment with which any number of unforeseen variables could complicate things. What if the astronauts needed to fix something outside their spacecraft? What if they needed to do something complex in a short time? They couldn't afford to be dealing with seemingly petty issues like visor fogging and tether wrestling that could threaten to jam up a difficult task. Not when lives were at stake. The mission of Gemini 11 would be commanded by Gemini 5 veteran, Navy Commander Pete Conrad. His partner, fellow astronaut and friend, Lieutenant Commander Richard Gordon. Conrad wasn't much of an EVA nut. In fact, he pushes hard for Gemini 11 to be more of a maneuvering-focused flight than a spacewalk-focused one. He had, since learning in 1965, about a scrapped plan to send a Gemini spacecraft all the way around the moon and back, been fixated on flying a high-orbit mission with the Agena. He campaigns hard for this, seeking experiments and mission objectives that would necessitate a high elliptical orbit. He downplays the effects of Van Allen belt radiation, proposing new orbital inclinations and pathways that would avoid the more hazardous zones. Furthermore, Gemini 11 pushes to fly the first direct ascent rendezvous. Using the traditional methods, they normally would make contact with the Agena after three or four orbits, but Conrad thinks they can do it with just one. Using a new controversial approach, many worry about the flow of information and the ability to effectively communicate the required maneuvers in such a short time window. Furthermore, Previous missions had all reported that the early workload had been too intense to keep up with. Conrad, however, is up for the challenge. Another novel idea is to conduct tethered flight. Not between the spacecraft and an astronaut, but between itself and the Agena. Richard Gordon, on EVA, will connect a long tether between the two vehicles. Then, later on, Conrad will undock and begin investigation into tethered formation flight, and even look into the early mechanics of centrifugal artificial gravity. All of these objectives seem rather unfocused, particularly given the obvious, pressing objective of mastering EVA. Nonetheless, spacewalking does remain at the heart of Gemini 11's mission, with Richard Gordon scheduled to make two spacewalks, both of them over an hour long. Gene Cernan and Gemini 12 pilot Buzz Aldrin begin exploring new training concepts, including the use of a neutral buoyancy tank. Cernan reflects positively on the results, but it's too late to meaningfully benefit Gordon. With a mission originally slated for September 9th, 
Leaks, computer errors, and issues with both the Titan and the Atlas caused three days of delays. Finally, at 8.05 on September 12th, Agena 11 was underway. T-minus 25 seconds and counting as the test conductor monitors his console. He's getting his green lights. T-minus 20. T-minus 18 seconds and counting. We have the sequencer in. T-minus 15. All still looking good. T-minus 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, 4, 3, Conrad and Gordon's launch window for a first orbit rendezvous is only two seconds long. Explosive bolts. T minus 15 seconds and counting. T minus 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1, 0. We have ignition. got to be the greatest ride in the world. It really is. It's a real thrill. Yeah, the only problem with the Titan is, is we don't get to ride it every week, once a year. Approaching six miles altitude, four miles downrange. Guidance update has just gone up in the spacecraft. Holding his controllers or a staging status. Houston, you're a go for stage. After making five maneuvers, the pair sight their Agena, and just 85 minutes after launch, they've made it. First orbit rendezvous had been achieved. Okay, we're stationed, keep them. Roger, outstanding. Hey, John, we're going to go ahead and dock at this time. Uh, Roger, it's uh, okay, and you're go for docking, over. Roger, you go for docking. Even better, they still had more than half of their maneuvering fuel. More than enough to facilitate docking practice. Conrad and Gordon both get to practice docking and undocking in both daylight and darkness. Onboard science experiments are working. The mission was progressing like a dream. They even get to test their Agena's primary engine using it to change their orbital inclination just slightly. The big boost would have to wait. Flight day one ends extremely well, as it had on Gemini 10. However, Gordon had two complicated spacewalks yet to complete. Flight day two. The pair prepare their EVA gear, and Gordon gets ready to go outside. He struggles with his sun visor, wrestling with the snaps and cracking it in the process of getting it fastened. Two minutes past the 24-hour mission mark, he maneuvers himself outside the spacecraft. Well, we have some. You got it. I sure hung on something out there. Got it. Good show. Okay, we got it. Gordon pushes himself towards the Agena, but misses and begins floating above the spacecraft. Conrad gently pulls on his umbilical and brings him back, resetting him for a second attempt. The Agena is completely lacking in handholds and foot restraints. Gordon must work one-handed as he braces himself against the vehicle, learning quickly that working outside in space is a battle of leverage and flexibility. Right up, cowboy. 
Yeah, why don't you just sit down and take a rest? Huh? How you doing? Tired, Pete. All right, just rest. Yeah, you got plenty of time. I like an outside, but... Predictably, he begins to get fatigued. Sweat pools on his forehead and face, running into his eyes and irritating them. It is extremely clear by now that the cooling properties of the Gemini spacesuit are completely and utterly inadequate for anything other than rest. Any amount of physical exertion has, three times now, put American astronauts in jeopardy. This hard experience, however, has a silver lining, as the next generation Apollo suits would have an emphasis on cooling, using water instead of air. Here's the most frustrating experience in the world, and this is trying to put that clamp on and put it in the right position. The position had to be fixed so that Pete and I both could see the status display panel on the Agena for the burn, so it had to be precisely in place before it could be locked down. Well, I was so single-minded at this time that I was going to get that tether on come hell or high water. And the tether was finally put in place. And then I came back to the spacecraft hatch, pretty exhausted at this time, and wanted to stand there and rest. We were a little bit behind by now, but we had a... Well, it so happened that, that the tremendous heat load that I put on the ELSS overtaxed its capabilities. and. It was cooling, it was working to design, I feel, and it was bringing the temperature down. But I had exerted so much energy that it was going to be a considerable length of time before I was able to do anything. Nighttime was approaching us, and I uh, wanted to get back in the adapter before it got dark. I was bothered with sweat in my right eye. Uh, it stung. I could blink my eye. I still had some vision out of it. Yeah, on the nose breathing. How you doing? After just 33 minutes, only a quarter of the planned length, Conrad decides to terminate EVA-1. Gordon has only just managed to secure the tether between the two vehicles. He hasn't been able to perform a planned power tool experiment, nor has he been able to use the handheld maneuvering gun, nor has he been able to install a simple mirror on the spacecraft. Gordon's first EVA had, by most standards, fallen shorter of its objectives than any others had previously. How many of these would it take for NASA to learn this lesson? One nicety that has been implemented was a planned relaxation period immediately following the work-heavy spacewalk. After jettisoning the now useless gear, the pair call it a day. A good, solid, fully successful EVA seemed a ghost that remained elusive to capture, but there was still much more to be done. Just over 40 hours into the mission, Conrad and Gordon button up their cabin and command the Agena to make its long burn, 26 seconds, adding another Mach number to their orbital velocity as they scream uphill. Passing India, uh, it became apparent to us that we were just climbing at a fantastic rate. I, I, uh, I don't know what the exact numbers were, but they were extremely high. And we could see this. We just, we just had the impression that we were looking down at the ground going straight up. We were wondering if we were going to stop or not. <laughs> we were worried about the orbital mechanics. <laughs> Their new apogee, 741 nautical miles above the Earth, completely smashing Gemini 10's altitude record. While the sights are most certainly fantastic for the crew, the pair don't get to stay long in their high orbit. And just after two earthly revolutions, they fire the Agena's engine again to lower it once more to terrestrial proportions. Almost immediately, preparations for EVA-2 begin. This would simply be a stand-up EVA, absent from any floating or wrestling with the unwieldy spacecraft. Phenomenal hatch. The forces were extremely low to close. 
that uh, we went ahead and packed our, our umbilical equipment and jettisoned it overboard and had a second hatch opening, this time with Dick strapped in the seat. And it just became apparent that that right-hand hatch was like your front door. We could open and close it any time we wanted to and, and uh, do anything we wanted with it. He is able to use both hands as he photographs star fields and operates primitive experiments in the vacuum of space. During the two-hour spacewalk, the pair even get a chance to rest and do nothing. Nothing but watch as their home planet passes by peacefully below them. Conrad and Gordon conclude EVA-2 much happier than they did EVA-1, and just 90 minutes later, the pair are ready to undock from the Agena, still tethered, and begin their mission's final objective. Two primary maneuvers are planned. The first involves aligning the two vehicles so that the Agena is between the Gemini and the Earth. Engineers hope that the simple gravity gradient between the two vehicles, with the Earth pulling on the Agena slightly harder by nature of its 100-foot lower altitude, will be enough to force the line taut. Say, we're gonna hate to leave this Agena and get pretty kind to it. Sure has. Conrad encounters difficulty in paying out the long tether, and when the Agena fails to stabilize its own attitude in the required time window, this first strategy is called off. The second strategy then involves slowly cartwheeling the two spacecraft, using centrifugal force to keep the tether straight. Conrad once again fights with the uncooperative tether. Operating in a brand new realm of experience, the mechanics and physics prove challenging and counterintuitive. However, eventually, the pair are able to settle the tether into its maximum length and initiate a 38 degree per minute cartwheel between the two vehicles. The crew eat and watch the Agena seemingly hover in place as the two vehicles slowly tumble end over end above the Earth. Other is, uh, is maintaining uh, attention at all times. Uh, impressed. One orbit later, Mission Control commands Conrad to accelerate the spin to 55 degrees per minute. They now begin their investigations into artificial gravity. While neither crew member could sense any force upon them, a quick test of releasing a camera in the cabin shows it dutifully move backwards, parallel to the tether. The slow spin-up had proven that reliable, long-term station keeping could in fact be accomplished economically. Gemini 11 had much more fuel left than anyone had expected. So much that after jettisoning their index bar and thus the tether, they had room to conduct further rendezvous and station keeping maneuvers, all improvised and not part of the original flight plan. The spacecraft's thrusters impinge on the long tether, causing it to wave and waggle in space. Finally, the pair make their final separation burn and wave goodbye to their Agena. 70 hours and 41 minutes after launch, Gemini 11 fires its retro rockets and prepares for another first, a fully automatic re-entry. Right the test pilot egos of the astronaut corps had long chafed against the intrusion of automated systems into the domain of peer piloting, but NASA grew increasingly adamant that the automatic systems at least be tested. On Gemini 11 there was no further room for delay. The computer flies the capsule through re-entry, commanding bank angles and navigating the ballistic lift profile, steering it all the way down to within 2.4 nautical miles of the USS Guam, just as good, if not better, than any human hand. There's no such thing as a perfect spacecraft, there's no such thing as a perfect mission. Uh, what you have to do, and uh, you have to learn to make decisions short of certainty. And I believe this was how we were able to achieve uh, the lunar landing, uh, starting from a cold start in 10 years. We were willing to accept some level of risk to get the job done. Uh, it has the ability to uh, give you the ultimate in confidence that you can walk right off that cliff and literally walk on air. At the same time, it can strip you literally naked and show every flaw that you have. 
uh, in knowledge, ability to form teams, trust between individuals right on down the line to accomplish your objective in spite of a problem on board the spacecraft. So basically, our job was to, uh, uh, the engineers would do the best job they could. They'd hand us the spacecraft and it was up to us to live with whatever risk remained in the spacecraft, the design of the spacecraft, design of the mission, that type of stuff. One final mission, Gemini 12, would be commanded by Gemini 7 veteran Jim Lovell, Navy Captain. His pilot is Edwin Aldrin, Air Force Major. Lovell is more conservative than Conrad, and recognizes that successful spacewalking was now a puzzle to be solved, and that the mission of Gemini 12 was NASA's only hope to solve it, before new hardware in Apollo could complicate matters. It was one final chance to test new strategies with familiar systems. His pilot, Buzz Aldrin, known as Dr. Rendezvous, relishes the task. He immerses himself in the neutral buoyancy training alongside his backup, Gene Cernan. As Buzz likes to tell it, his avid scuba diving experience greatly contributes to his training for Gemini 12. If anyone has the mind required to crack this puzzle, it's Buzz. Buzz Aldrin has always had a complex relationship with his peers and NASA. From his advocacy for the dangerous EVA fairing fix on Gemini 9, to later conversations about being the first to step on the moon on Apollo 11, even before the commander, Neil, in keeping with Project Gemini tradition, Aldrin comes across as occasionally alienating and insensitive. Though he's certainly not the most popular astronaut, None can question his operational intelligence or dedication. Dr. Rendezvous becomes Dr. Spacewalk, almost single-handedly revolutionizing the way EVA training is done. As the launch date for Gemini 12 fast approaches, the conservative and experienced level, paired with the all-business Aldrin, seem a mature crew, as ready as any in Gemini could ever be to squash the EVA bug. After Ed White's Gemini 4, which really didn't do much to learn about walking in space, uh, they decided to do some pretty de detailed uh, work in outside the spacecraft. Started with uh, really Gemini 9, they are going to have an AMU, an uh, Astronaut Maneuvering Unit, and it was in the back of the spacecraft. Gene Cernan was going to do the work on it. They got outside and tried to, try to do the work, and uh, the hand holes were not good, the toe holes, he heated up, his, his visor fogged over, he had trouble doing things which he could do easily in training, and uh, so eventually he came back into the spacecraft and they abandoned that. Uh, they again attempted it on 10, not, not the MU, but they attempted to do work on 10. What happened was that on 9 and 10, and then eventually also 11, when Dick Gordon was outside and he overheated and everything, all of us forgot about one of Newton's third laws of motion to every action there's an equal and rea uh, uh, reaction. Consequently, when they went to touch the spacecraft, the spacecraft repelled them. You don't see that on Earth, but you sure see that up in space in the zero gravity atmosphere when you have a big mass like the spacecraft. And so when 12 rolled around, they said, let's uh, devote a lot of time on 12 to find out how we can really work outside the spacecraft. And it just so happened that someone, I don't know who it was, said, well, how about underwater? Wouldn't that give you sort of a, uh, an idea of zero gravity if we can make the astronaut neutrally buoyant? And a spacesuit will work just as well underwater as it will in space. So NASA rented a, a, a swimming pool in a boys' school up in Baltimore. Buzz and I went up there with the, all the crew, and we put Buzz in a spacesuit, got him in the water, made him neutrally buoyant. I had communication with him, and I sat on the side of the pool as if I was inside the spacecraft, went through some of the basics. We had a crude mock-up in the, in the water itself, learning about working in space, learning about the proper hand holes and the proper toe holes uh, to make sure that everything would work. Furthermore, significant changes were finally being made to help Gemini spacecraft crews outside their vehicle. A meager nine restraint points on Gemini 9 had grown to 44 for Gemini 12. 2.08 p.m., November 11th, 1966, Armistice Day. We launch control at T-minus six minutes and counting. All systems still going well. We'll be coming up in about uh, three minutes into our built-in hold. 
A major highlight occurring at the blockhouse at this time, a final status check of all aspects of the mission. Uh, the crewmen are now reporting back go as their various systems are called out. T-minus, one minute and counting. T-minus, 60 seconds and counting. All systems still looking good. The sequence still continues to come in. We have an Agena ready light. We have a range safety ready light. The final ready light has just come on at T-minus 45 seconds and counting. All systems still looking good. T-minus 40 seconds and counting. The crew continues to monitor in the blockhouse. Recorders are now to fast speed. T-minus 30 seconds and counting. T-minus 30. All our sequent lights appear to be on as we reach T minus 24 seconds and counting. T minus 20 seconds and counting. T minus 15 seconds and counting. The sequencer is in. We're on an automatic sequencer at this time. T minus 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, 4. Pad as a tunnel of water is released beneath the rocket's blast. It's there to cool the steel on the launch pad. The rendezvous target is off its pad. It's on a smooth flight, and you can now hear the roar as it crosses our NBC observation. hour and a half later, the final curtain begins to close on the second chapter of American spaceflight. And all are reporting go. Now T minus five minutes, eight seconds and counting. This is Gemini Launch Control. In launch Control, we're at T minus two minutes and counting. T minus two, all systems still go with the Gemini launch vehicle and spacecraft at this time. The launch vehicle and the spacecraft have received the proper updates, that is, the proper parameters for flight. These were the final versions were fed to the launch vehicle and spacecraft just after we resumed our countdown at T-minus 3. All reports come back good at T-minus 40 seconds and counting. T-minus 15 seconds and counting. Quiet in the blockhouse as we continue to monitor at 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1, 0. We have ignition. An hour after launch, the pair begin receiving radar data from the Agena as they close in. However, fairly quickly, their radar begins to fail. Now without reliable onboard tracking information, Dr. Rendezvous pounces at the chance 
to whip out orbital charts and his onboard sextant. 279 pounds of fuel and two hours later, the two vehicles are in proximity just as planned. When Buzz noticed that the computer wasn't given any change of range, and I had looked down at the little green light that tells us that we have a radar lock on, and it was off. And for a minute there, both of us just looked at each other. We said, oh no, it, it can't happen to us. Any, anybody else or any other time, but gee, not this time. But something had dawned on us that, sure enough, our radar had indeed failed. And we went to the uh, radar backup procedures, which we had practiced quite a bit in our pre-flight training, but really never expected to use. The first thing on my list, it said, acquire the target visually. And I looked up there, and I couldn't see a thing. Uh, just prior to the flight, the backup crew came over to me and, uh, and said, uh, Jim, you know who you're flying with? And I said, I, I think I do. My compatriot uh, knows quite a bit about rendezvous. He has a doctorate in the science of uh, related subjects. And they said, you better not bust this one. During this time, Mission Control analyzes telemetry from the Agena's launch. A worrying decay in thrust during its insertion into orbit throws its primary propulsion system into doubt. After the experience of Gemini 6's Agena rocket engine exploding, Mission Control decides not to light it again during this mission, effectively canceling any high-altitude flight. Instead, Lovell and Aldrin will use the secondary propulsion system, changing their inclination to fly right through the shadow of a solar eclipse. I had on my side a very almost opaque gold filter which I could see the round circle of the sun. And it was my job to track the sun through this filter as, it, as we came up to the eclipse. Uh, just as the time was approaching, I could see the moon, which was a dark disk, come across the, the limb of the sun and start to, start to occult it. Uh, I thought at first that we were really gonna miss it because it appeared that the moon was a little bit lower than the sun and that we would never get a total eclipse. But as we approach this position and we approach the time of totality, suddenly the complete window became black and in an impulse I ripped off the, the filter and looked, looked out and I could see a, a black disc against a sort of a, a black sky with a brilliant ring around it of the corona of the, of the sun. Just for a few seconds I took a look at the total eclipse and I knew that uh, we had indeed completed the rendezvous. Shortly thereafter, I put the filter back on, and soon the, this very brilliant sphere of the sun shining through from the other side of the moon had, had, had taken place. It was quite a beautiful sight. After a rest period, the pair observe the eclipse 16 hours into their mission, and Aldrin then begins preparation for his first spacewalk. Buzz performs UV photography, installs a telescoping handrail between the Gemini and the Agena, and retrieves a micrometeorite collection package. His two-hour and 20-minute EVA-1 is deliberately conservative. NASA wants to build up to the complex stuff, and it proves to be highly successful. Aldrin completes all objectives without so much as breaking a sweat. The remainder of the second day 
is spent operating experiments, and the crew goes to sleep at 29 hours, 30 minutes after launch. On the morning of the next day, problems begin to develop in the fuel cells. Poor load sharing and the failure of a fuel cell purge frustrate the crew, who are forced to remove one of the stacks off the line completely. Gemini 12 isn't a long mission at just four days. Nevertheless, electrical problems are never a welcome thing. 42 hours, 48 minutes. EVA 2. Aldrin maneuvers himself along the handrail to the Agena docking adapter and installs the tether to the Gemini indexing bar. Using his own waist tether for leverage, he completes the task with relative ease, encountering none of the problems that had plagued Richard Gordon on the prior mission. He then moves back to the Gemini, continuing past the hatch and entering the area of the adapter section, where he tests a variety of restraints, including a pair of overshoe foot restraints nicknamed the Golden Slippers. He unpacks lights, torques bolts, and cuts metal. Small, seemingly superfluous tasks, but ones designed to test the ability of a human to work in space. He then crawls all the way back to the Agena and begins interacting with a fidget box located there, pulling electrical connectors apart and putting them back together again. It seemed like the astronauts were pulling wool over the eyes of mission control. Few on the ground could believe just how easily everything was progressing. Aldrin moves slowly but surely, keeping his body in check and never fighting or forcing the objects around him or his own drifting instead using momentum to his advantage, letting the microgravity work for him, not the other way around. Aldrin's success on Gemini 12 represents a true paradigm shift in EVA approach. For NASA, there was no substitute for victory. First, I think we learned uh, <clears throat> the value, the great value of a restraint system. In order to perform a task in EVA, we first must take the time to set up a restraint to the body that will substitute for the 1G that we have down here where, where our feet are in contact with the ground. We have to fix the, uh, the body in a position where we can then devote our entire effort to the task at hand. EVA-2 concludes after two hours and six minutes, a tour de force for Aldrin and for NASA. The spacewalking curse had finally been broken. Things went uh, quite a bit smoother than I had uh, actually uh, thought that they would. We had to anticipate many, many problems that could arise, and it was just through continual uh, training and going over these uh, procedures that uh, we were able to learn what these pitfalls might be and how to avoid them. 48 hours into the flight, Lovell undocks from the Agena and begins testing the gravity gradient maneuver in tethered flight that had eluded Conrad and Gordon. The pair find limited success, but the results prove disappointing. Environment 12, uh, what uh, control mode do you show the Agena in now? And uh, how much gas? Uh... Okay, about five pounds of gas. Has there been much uh, uh, thruster activity on the Agena recently? Uh, just very little. Uh, 12, this is Carnarvon. Uh, how close to setting up the Agena do you think you have it? Well, we're trying to get back into position now, and I think uh, we may have a slightly better uh, uh, crack at it this time than we had before. Our uh, rates uh, seem to be null down a lot better. Right, we're straight above him now, and the tether is taut, and rates look like they're uh, damped out rather nicely. I think we've got a pretty good chance this time. Good luck to you. About this time, uh, we had a little thruster problems, as you might know. Uh, 
both uh, two and four thrusters were out. And every time that I wanted to pitch up or, or yaw, I would roll. And it really got to be quite frustrating. I, I, I got mad at it occasionally because I, I couldn't do anything. I, every time I wanted to do something, I'd always roll. Uh, but we finally, uh, through a learning curve, determined uh, how to handle this situation by using a maneuver thruster, actually beeping a little bit to, to bring it around and counteract this roll. After some four hours of tethered flight, they jettison their docking bar and separate permanently from the Agena. Gemini 12 encounters more hardware issues than prior flights. Lovell reports degradation of his thrusters and more problems with his fuel cells, issues not encountered since the days of Gemini 5. The fuel cell issue is chalked up to the water storage system. Their warning lights go out every time they dispense water. The onboard fuel cells produce water alongside electricity. For some reason, the storage system wasn't accepting as much water as it should. The two astronauts begin to water load, dispensing and drinking water more regularly in order to make room in the tanks. They nurse the fuel cells along successfully for the rest of their flight. The batteries had to be brought online just one orbit prior to re-entry. Guess what we've got for you to do? Uh, I don't know fuel cell purge. Make that two and then one, O2 purge. 30 seconds? That's affirmative. You want it now? As soon as possible, right? Uh, I'm right in the middle of a helmeted uh, T2. You want another T2? Stand by. Because, by the way, we checked the thrusters. Four and eight are dead completely. Uh, two takes 12 seconds to build up to one degree, and seven takes uh, 17 seconds, I believe. All the rest of them check out. Okay. Thank you. 93 hours, 59 minutes, 58 seconds. Retrofire. The final in Project Gemini. It was the 23rd of March, 1965, exactly 20 months ago, that the Gemini 3 gave this country its first two-man flight with a three-orbital mission. Since that time, and including Gemini 3, uh, we have had 10 flights. These flights have given this country a tremendous amount of experience in manned exploration of space. We have learned how to maneuver in space, including rendezvous and docking, and after docking to still further maneuver with a propulsion system with the dock to Gina. We've learned how to, to live in space and to operate in space with men and to carry out scientific and technical experiments. More recently, we've learned not only how to operate from within the capsule, but how to operate outside the capsule in a free condition, which has proved to be more difficult than we'd anticipated. But as a result of this last flight of Gemini 12, we now much better understand how to plan our extravehicular activities for the future. Let us also remember that the missions ahead are exceedingly complex. We're going to explore out to distances of a quarter of a million miles. The missions include, of course, the, uh, the flights around the moon and not the landing on the moon itself. So as we listen here today to the magnificent accomplishments of Captain Level and Colonel Aldrin, let us not forget that there is much, much hard work ahead before we can say that we have attained our national goals of preeminence in space. Level 2 observes a completely automatic re-entry, splashing down just 2.6 nautical miles from the target point. The Gemini entries were getting so close to the recovery ships that they actually begin staging further away for fears of being struck by the descending spacecraft. Gemini 12 had flipped the script of the immediately preceding flights hardware frustrations overcome by operational excellence, as opposed to near-flawless hardware hampered by objective difficulty and flawed strategy. But most importantly, slowly but surely, Project Gemini had ticked each of the boxes, one by one, for Apollo. EVA, duration flight, 
Rendezvous. Station keeping. Docking. Rendezvous again. Docking again. Again and again and again. Over and over until they could do it with their eyes closed. Until they could do it a quarter of a million miles away, orbiting an alien world with no ground stations and no safety net. Project Gemini was the bitter medicine that hardened NASA and made it moon ready. A chapter two, overshadowed by both one and three, long overlooked and underappreciated in history, and yet a crucial adolescence without which giant leaps could not have been made. Mysteriously absent from the headlines for quite a long time was the Soviet Union, who had not flown a mission into space almost two years ago now, in March of 1965. Since then, all of Project Gemini had taken place to no Soviet answer. Nikita Khrushchev had been swept away, and eventually a much more establishment Soviet regime headed by the likes of Leonid Brezhnev and Alexei Kasigin, had taken his place. The new Soviet regime, much less focused on flashy headlines and pioneering firsts, spent much of this time retooling its own space program, deciding instead to skip the second chapter of spaceflight altogether. And instead of building orbital experience with proven hardware, they have begun immediately constructing new hardware for a lunar program a novel spacecraft called Soyuz, which would make its maiden flight in the new year. As 1966 comes to a close, 1967 begins for both nations as a year of dream and high promise. One cosmonaut prepares for a risky mission on a complex new vehicle. Three astronauts ready themselves for a bold flight on their own advanced hardware the first of its kind to carry humans. A nation, increasingly mired in war overseas, looks forward to fulfilling a promise while struggling to build a great society at home. The 1960s were far from over. One pill makes you long.